6.30 p.m. Good evening, I'm Huey Lin on News 5 tonight. I have the ability to be mentally agile and move from one thing to the other. Corporate leaders extol the benefits of a liberal arts degree. The Chinese national who allegedly hijacked a taxi and rammed into a man at the budget terminal has been charged. IMF chief Christine Lagarde says China's yuan could become a reserve currency. If you live here, you will feel like a part of you is missing. And today marks the last day of operations for the outlets at East Coast Park's Marine Cove area. Singapore's first liberal arts college is due to be open next year. And ahead of that, a panel of corporate leaders addressed prospective students and their parents. The view put forth at the Yale NUS dialogue session is that a liberal arts degree has never been more relevant than it is today. They work for some of the biggest global companies, hiring the best minds across the world. But today, this panel of corporate leaders was at the behest of potential Yale and U.S. students. Now, the dialogue session is part of a series of events at the NUS Open House this year, with the aim of providing prospective students and their parents some insight into what a liberal arts degree is all about. And indeed, this question seemed to be on top of everyone's list. My understanding for um, people your age is that it, the, the view is it's going to go down to like two or three years. If you're really going to switch to, you know, between different firms that often and different types of roles, what you need to be able to do is go, aha, uh -huh, you know, I got a month at it or two months at it, I get the basics. They're going to keep training me all along, but I, you know, I have the ability to be mentally agile and move from one thing to the other. The opening of the college next year is also good news for companies which, as recently as five years ago, looked to hire U.S. and U.K. university graduates. With Yale and U.S., I think we are very excited about this uh, because we do see this as uh, the path forward and, and just increasing the number of uh, resources that we have to tap into to hire people. Still, many say it's a leap of faith into new paradigms. I'm being in as an Asian, I mean, so brought up into the culture where uh, the three or four success professions, which could be engineer, or you become a doctor, or you become a CPA or an accountant, for example. I think even the parents should attend this, understand it, how exactly the different fields are emerging, how the students can get benefited from that, where the world is moving to. The deadline for the college's inaugural round of applications is 1st April this year. The man who allegedly crashed a taxi into the budget terminal, resulting in the death of a cleaner yesterday, has been charged. The suspect, a 30-year-old technician from China, was charged with voluntarily causing hurt to the cab driver while robbing him of his taxi. Police say the charge was read out to him at Changi General Hospital, where he's warded for some injuries. If convicted, he can be jailed between 5 and 20 years and given at least 12 strokes of the cane. Separately, police are also investigating the suspect over the death of 34-year-old cleaner Chandra Mogan. They say more charges are expected to be filed against the suspect. International Monetary Fund Chief Christine Lagarde says China's yuan could become a reserve currency in the future. Ms. Lagarde floated this possibility at a gathering of top Chinese policymakers and global business leaders in Beijing. It would mean that China could break the dollar's dominance as the principal global unit of cross-border trade. It could also help China battle internal inflation risks. But Ms. Lagarde says that China would need to make reforms, including a roadmap for a stronger, more flexible exchange rate system for that to happen. She added, though, that financial reform is needed around the world. Despite improved conditions, she warned against global finance complacency. In all those fields, it requires an appetite for change, it requires leadership, and it requires consensus. And all those uh, drivers are going to be critical in achieving the reforms. A three-way extradition tussle is brewing after Libya's former spy chief was arrested in West Africa. The new Libyan government says it's ready and able to give Abdullah al-Sanusi a fair trial in Libya. A military source in Mauritania says Abdullah al-Sanusi is staying at a residence used for visiting officials as an international debate grows over his fate. 
Local reports say Sanusi was arrested with a false passport after arriving on a regular flight from Morocco. Before the Gaddafi regime fell last year, Sanusi was the late Libyan leader's fearsome spy master and right-hand man. He's said to be behind a prison massacre in 1996, where more than 1,000 detainees were gunned down. He's also wanted for attacking civilians while trying to crush last year's uprising. On the day rebels took down Tripoli, he had remained defiant. أما فيما يتعلق بما يحصل في ليبيا فليبيا دولة شعبية والشعب الليبي هو اللي بيحكم وليبيا لن يحكم تحكمها العصابات الإرهابية والشعب الليبي مصمم على الانتصار وهذه العصابات يعني اعتبروها في حكم منتهي the spy chief has since spent the past months on the run. His eventual capture was the result of joint efforts by the French and Mauritanian authorities, according to a statement from Paris. Along with Libya and the International Criminal Court, France will seek Sanusi's extradition. A Paris court had previously sentenced him in absentia to life for involvement in the bombing of a French airliner in 1989 that killed 170 people. Sanusi's name has also been linked with the bombing of a Pan Am jet over Lockerbie in 1988. The two incidents led to a UN-mandated air blockade of Libya in 1992. Mauritanian police say they want to investigate Sanusi with Interpol before considering any extradition requests. They did not say how long the investigation might take. Timor-Leste President Jose Ramos Horta's bid for re-election appears in doubt. He's facing elimination as he trails behind two other strong contenders as vote counting continues. The election commission says Francisco Guterres, who's from the main opposition Fretilin party, is leading with some 27% of votes. Mr. Guterres is followed by former army chief and guerrilla leader Jose Maria de Vasconcelos with 24%. He is also known as Tau Matan Ruak. Dr. Ramos Horta is in third place with 19%. If no one wins a 51% majority, the top two contenders will go into a final round of voting. Coming up on News 5. How far can you go by giving out more and more? Rising health care costs and manpower concerns are addressed in a dialogue session with ministers. And a gathering of white shirts in central Bangkok, all in the name of peace. News 5 tonight. Today marks the start of Singapore's first community arts festival. Hundreds took part in the inaugural Passion Arts Month, which was launched by Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong. Well, heavy showers threatened to dampen the mood, but the public joined in the festivities in Bishan after it cleared. It's Korean pop at its finest in Singapore's heartlands. No, these performers haven't been specially flown in from Seoul. They are ordinary residents with an extraordinary interest in pop culture. And Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong had a first-hand taste of youth energy. This energy has been harnessed in a nationwide month-long initiative to expose the community to the arts. Talk about installation art. Well, what we have here is a living room in the park made out of recycled items like electronic spare parts, old fridges, buckets. The only drawback, no shelter. Some, though, already have thoughts about how exposure to arts and culture can be improved. Being the first um, um, initiative that uh, um, the, the authorities have actually uh, come up with, um, I think I think the... the, the there could have been actually more time, you know, uh, dedicated to the running of this uh, whole event. The Prime Minister got in on the act himself, drumming to the beat of Abba's Mamma Mia. This is what the organisers call community music time. Everyone play music together, so it's like quite meaningful. Uh. And then um, it's like... We, we get to practice a lot uh, during these rehearsals and then we, we get to improve on, on our own skills. 
To bring arts and culture to the masses, the government is investing up to 210 million Sing dollars over half a decade in a community engagement master plan. Healthcare initiatives raised during the recent budget debate have been fairly well received by the public, but there are still concerns over rising costs and manpower capacity. Some of these issues were raised at a dialogue session chaired by Health Minister Gan Kim Yong and Minister of State for Health Amy Kaur. Better health insurance coverage and more subsidies. These are the focus of the Healthcare 2020 Master Plan. But while the government makes efforts to provide relief to those who need it, there are concerns this may lead to higher costs in the long term. You are uh, giving benefits on one side, but it might come back and then, you know, uh, haunt the citizens again uh, through the insurance companies uh, in terms of uh, higher premiums. The government may feel a little bit of a pinch, you know, giving out more and more. But how far can you go by giving out more and more and more? First, we change the way we do things to make sure that the cost maybe will still go up and go up slower than what it would have been had we not done it. Secondly, we want to make sure that uh, we encourage people to use the right level of uh, Medicare, medical care so that you don't consume uh, medical services that are unnecessary. Mr. Gan added there are measures in place to help offset premium increases on MediShield, such as GST vouchers for the elderly. Manpower capacity was another concern raised by participants, made up mainly of healthcare workers and grassroots volunteers. If the government wants to lower the number of foreign foreigners who, who come in, so um, how do we then you know, manage and calibrate it so that we, we have good nurses and um, other um, healthcare professionals who, who want to still come in and help to boost our, our healthcare systems? We will increase the local intake here, but we will also try and get more of our Singaporeans who are studying overseas to come back. Uh, that in itself, uh, may still not be sufficient, especially in the short to medium term. So we'll still have to continue to uh, get, uh, attract some of the uh, foreigners uh, who are trained in recognised universities come back uh, to come to Singapore to provide uh, services. Now, in conjunction with this feedback exercise, which also conducted a telephone call to assess Singaporeans' reactions to Budget 2012. And when it came to healthcare, the policy that was most well received was increasing subsidies in the intermediate and long term care sector. Today marks the last weekend of operations for tenants at Marine Cove at East Coast Park before the area undergoes redevelopment. This comes as the leases for the businesses there end this month. Now the area was still bustling with many spending their weekend here despite the wet weather. Some shops had already moved out while others, like the McDonald's outlet, will end operations at midnight. The outlet has been here since 1982 and is its first in Singapore to open 24 hours. It's understood that the National Parks Board will redevelop the area with better access to the beach and more space for parks. Many welcome the move but also have fond memories of the place. So, uh... Childhood, no? Secondary school, primary school, we used to come here for overnight. Yeah, so now I brought my son here, then uh, they have their, you know, the class gathering here also. So it, it's a uh, quite two to three generation thing. Now it's closing. <laughs> Seems a bit sad, uh, but we, we also would like to see what's going to happen in the future. Yeah, we're quite used to this place and we, we know it's the last day, so we just came here on purpose just to see how is it like on the last day. Australia is bracing for its second cyclone in as many days. Forecasters say it's forming in the northern gulf of Carpentaria region. They're warning residents to prepare for gales of up to 185 kilometres per hour and possible flash flooding. Cyclone Lua tore through western Australia's Pilbara region, a key iron ore and gas mining hub, on Saturday. It gradually lost strength as it moved inland. At its peak, the cyclone brought heavy rains and winds of up to 250 kilometres per hour. It forced the closure of Port Hedland, but the world's biggest iron ore port has since reopened. Emergency officials said damage was significantly minor considering the cyclone's severity. There were no immediate reports of injuries. And it was a special day for thousands of Buddhists in Thailand. They gathered to give alms to monks, commemorating 2,600 years since Buddha achieved enlightenment. Morning had hardly broken, but tens of thousands of Buddhists had already gathered in central Bangkok. 
mostly wearing white, they brought along arms for more than 20,000 monks. The Dhammakaya temple, which organized the event, is on a mission. The organizers hope to see one million monks receiving arms this year. This is the sixth arms-giving event they've organized this month. Followers have been told to prepare dried or packaged food. This will be sent to Buddhist monks in Thailand's rest of southern provinces. Violence has prevented monks there from making rounds to collect arms. Some Buddhists are also taking the opportunity to pray for an end to the violence. And still to come on 5, I'll have all the excitement from the 6th Ironman Triathlon held here. Plus... In Formula One action, McLaren's Jensen Button has won the season opening Australian Grand Prix in Melbourne. Bolton Wanderer's Fabrice Muamba is fighting for his life in a London hospital. He collapsed during Bolton's FA Cup quarter-final match against Tottenham Hotspur at White Hart Lane yesterday. The 23-year-old midfielder fell face down on the pitch near the centre circle just before half-time. Medics rushed to the field with a defibrillator to treat him, pumping his chest for around six minutes without success before rushing him to the hospital. The match was abandoned at one all. I think we've got to understand that Fabrice is, is critically ill. The next 24 hours are going to be absolutely crucial. Yeah. And uh, all our thoughts, all our prayers, uh, we've also been inundated with, with people uh, wishing him well and we hope that you know, if everybody can play strongly tonight that, uh, that Fabrice is able to recover. Players from both teams were shocked, as were the fans. Muamba was born in the Democratic Republic of Congo, but went to England when he was very young. The former England under-21 international was a regular for the country and even captained the team. He joined Bolton from Birmingham City in 2008 in a deal worth over £5 million. He's made 130 league appearances for the club. I, I absolutely love him. I'm just gutted. I just hope he pulls for him. It's all about Muamba, it's not about Bolton Wanderers anymore. It's about him as a person. Now Sunderland has forced a replay after holding Everton to a one-all draw in the other FA Cup quarter-final. Scottish defender Phil Bardsley gave the Black Hats an early lead when he fired the ball home through a crowded penalty area in the 12th minute. But Everton later levelled the score with a header from Tim Cahill. The match ended with a fantastic double save by Sunderland's goalkeeper Simon Mignolet in stoppage time. English Premier League champions Manchester United have kicked off their league tie against hosts Wolverhampton Wanderers. The match is currently goalless. United lead the standings over cross-city rivals Manchester City by a point. And the Red Devils could stretch that lead to four with a win at Wolves, as City are only due to play their league tie against Chelsea in the middle of the week. Singapore's national paddlers arrived home this evening after their sterling performance at the Asian Table Tennis Championships in Macau. They received a warm welcome at Changi Airport. Gao Ning and Yang Zi clinched the men's doubles title at the Games last month, making it Singapore's first Asian Championships title since 1954. The tournament also turned out to be Singapore's best medal haul. Besides the gold, Team Singapore won three silver medals in the women's team, women's doubles and mixed doubles events. Asia's largest Ironman triathlon returned for its sixth installment this morning. And the hot, humid conditions did not stop defending champion American Mary Beth Ellis from holding on to her title. Some 1,600 athletes competed in this year's race, swimming 1.9 kilometers, cycling 90.1 kilometers, and running 21.1 kilometers. And it was the 35-year-old American who led the women's race from the outset. She crossed the finish line in 4 hours 19 minutes. 23-year-old Josh Amberger clinched the men's race in 3 hours, 54 minutes. It's the Australian's first ever Ironman 70.3 title. You know, I came here to win. I, 
didn't come here for second place and as soon as we got onto the run I took the lead and I didn't just didn't want to let go of the lead you know this this race was mine to win and and that's what kept me going just crossing the line first I'm thrilled. Um, I love coming to Singapore and racing the 70.3 here and to come back and defend is, is just a great honor. Um, you know, it, it's just great training. Um, good to get a hard race in early in the year. And that's News 5 tonight. Good night.